Well, good afternoon, everybody. So first of all, I'd just like to uh, make sure you all have the homework assignment um, in case I maybe didn't get this earlier. Um, again, a reminder that problem 532 has been moved from homework set number five, which would have been due today, into homework set number six, because we really haven't quite covered that material yet. So if you turned it in with today's homework, uh, I'm not going to grade it, but um, you, know, you just have to resubmit it next Wednesday. So, you might recall that we are now talking about the first law of thermodynamics for an open system. And what I've done essentially is derive the general equation for the first law for you. Now, you may note that this general form is not the final form. The general form of the first law tells me that the rate of heat transfer um, plus the okay, plus the sum overall inlet streams of the mass flow rate at the inlet and then multiplied by the enthalpy of the inlet plus kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the inlet. Um, this is going to equal the change with respect to time of the energy within the control volume, and then plus the sum overall exit flow paths of m dot e times the enthalpy at the exit, plus the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy at the exit, and then plus the rate that work is being done by this control volume. So this is the general form of the first law that we are going to eventually use. Now, please note that this is only one form of the first law. Um, there are going to be other forms that we're going to be talking about here shortly. Okay. So what I want to do now is move on to one of our most important special cases, which is actually a special case we talked about briefly with regard to the continuity equation a week ago. Um, and that's the case of steady flow. Now, we've talked about what steady flow means with regards to the continuity equation. It basically means that the rate that mass flows in um, is going to equal the rate that mass flows out. So, you know, that, that makes sense. Of course, implied in this is that there's no change in mass within the control volume. And that makes sense, right? If the mass increases, then our piece of mechanical equipment might just blow up on us. If the mass keeps diminishing, eventually it's just going to suck itself onto itself. It's going to implode, if you will. And um, steady flow problems are very, very common. Um, but there's more to a steady flow problem than just noting that the rate that mass flows in is equal to the rate that mass flows out. Um, with regards to some of these energy terms here, we would note that there's no change in the state of the control volume. And remember, I'm just using the abbreviation CV for control volume. That, that is the open system we're dealing with. So there's no change in the state within the control volume, um, which really is important if you look up to the first law above, then what does that tell us about the change of the energy of the control volume with respect to time? It's just zero, right? I mean, energy is a property. If the state doesn't change, then the properties aren't changing, and there's no change in the energy. So that term is going to just equal to zero. Um, a couple of other things that we would just note is that there's no change in the state of the fluids that are entering or exiting at the boundaries. So basically, whatever the thermodynamic properties are at the inlet are going to always be the thermodynamic properties at the inlet. They're not going to change over time. And whatever those properties are at the exit are always going to be the same over time. They're, they're never going to change 
um, as time goes by either. So that, that doesn't mean that the inlet and the exit have the same thermodynamic state. I'm not saying that those are the same. I'm just simply saying that there's no change in state at the inlet conditions and at the separate exit conditions, there's also no change in the state. So that's another aspect to these particular problems. Um, and another thing is that all heat transfer terms and work terms um, will remain constant over time. So if you're given the rate of heat transfer at the beginning of the problem, it's always going to be the same as the rate of heat transfer through the entire process. The same thing with the work, or technically W dot is a power term, or rate of doing work term. So these are just some things that you would have to recognize. Now, how does this affect our first law? Well, honestly, not a whole lot. Um, it certainly gets rid of the EDT term, but everything else is still going to be there. Now, it's customary, um, at least I've always known it to be customary, to move the work term from the right-hand side over to the left-hand side. So let's just rewrite the first law. However, we'll rewrite it recognizing that the DET term goes away. So rewrite with DET equal to zero. And rearrange so we get Q dot minus W dot is then just going to equal, and we'll move the inlet terms over to the right-hand side. So we have the sum over all exits of m dot e, h e, plus p e squared over 2 plus g z e, and then minus the sum over all inlet streams, m dot i, h i, plus p i squared over 2 plus g z i. Um, so this is the first law for a steady flow problem uh, for a control flow. And the vast majority of the problems that we're going to deal with are indeed steady flow types of problems. Now, this isn't the end of it either. I mean, certainly we have a lot of steady flow problems that this particular equation would relate to. For instance, if we have a heat exchanger, right? We know that there's two inlet streams, and we know there's two exit streams. So we're definitely going to have, you know, two exit terms, two inlet terms, and they'll have to be considered in our equation. But there's also a special case of the special case. And this is what we'd call the single stream steady flow problem. So a further special case would be the following. So this special case problem is for the single stream steady flow. And we just abbreviate this SSSF for single stream steady flow. So for single stream steady flow problems, it becomes even easier on the right-hand side of the equation. Um, we would note that we can drop the summations entirely. There's no summation, right? There's only one inlet and there's only one outlet. So we can drop the summations. And we would note that with only a single stream and no accumulation of mass, this is still a steady flow problem, even though it's a single stream, then the inlet flow rate equals the exit flow rate. In fact, we'll just call this m dot. It's the flow rate. Whatever the mass flow rate is moving through the system is the mass flow rate. The same at the inlet, the same at the exit. So we can rewrite our first law again, and it's a little bit simpler. So we have the heat transfer minus work equals, and now since we have the same m dot for both the inlet and the exit, we can just combine all of our terms and modify them by one mass flow rate, and then we can also combine the like terms. So I'll just put the enthalpy terms together. So we have HE minus HI. I'll put the kinetic energy terms together. So V squared minus VI squared over two. And I can put the potential energy terms together. So G, ZE minus ZI. And this then is the first law 
for a single stream steady flow process for a control line. And this is by far the most common equation that we're going to use um, you know, as we you know, look at this particular area of GP5. Now, it should be noted that some problems allow us to make a simplification if we note that lowercase q is this q dot over m dot. I mean, it's also equal to q over m. We've seen that before. But if we then just divide both numerator and denominator by time, or if you will, if you take time derivatives, then it's still the same lowercase letter q, right? Um, and we would note that lowercase w is w dot over mass flow rate. Um, and note, we're talking about the control volume still, so I'll put a CD and CD here. Um, although I will note that um, I would just drop the CV at this point. I mean, these are control volume problems. I mean, it's obvious you don't need to remind yourself of that continuously by writing a CV every time. So I'm just going to drop the CV. And if I take my first law and then simply divide by the mass flow rates on both sides. I mean, again, you know that's just the same as divided by 1. Um, then we get a further simplification. So q dot over m dot would be just q, lowercase q. Uh, w dot over m dot is lowercase w. m dot over m dot, well, m dot over m dot is just 1, so that completely disappears. In other words, you don't even need the mass flow rate. And then all we're left with are our other terms. So this is the first law for a single stream steady flow process, but just written in a different form. Okay, it's just an alternate form. Um, so as usual, read the problem carefully. If you're asked to find things like rate of heat transfer or power, which is rate of doing work, well, then you need to use the previous version of the first application. If you're given information or you're asked to find such things as work per unit mass or heat per unit mass, well, then use this um, you know, latter version of first law equation. Um, they're both applicable. They're both correct. They're just different. And the last thing I want to note then, um, and, and the, um, the last thing I would note is that the author of your textbook, um, and, and I know I mentioned this when we talked about the continuity equation, the author replaces I with a 1 and E with a 2. So you may see this written something like Q12 minus W12 equals H2 minus H1 plus B2 squared minus D1 squared over 2 plus GZ2 minus C1. Um, so as long as you're just aware of that, um, 1 and 2 still represent the inlet and the exit, right? They, they don't represent the initial and final state here. Uh, it's just the inlet and the exit state. So you look at the equations for the first law, and it might, you know, or say you might want to just simply note that it doesn't look a whole lot different than the first law for the closed system, right? The big difference, honestly, is that we're always going to use enthalpy change in the first law for, well, for these steady flow processes. We're always going to use the enthalpy change within the first law equation here. But if this were a closed system, we would use the internal energy change. But the equation looks practically identical, doesn't it? Heat transfer minus work, or if we go heat transfer on the left, work over on the right. Um, you'll have an enthalpy change term instead of an internal energy change. You'll have a kinetic energy and a potential energy change term. Um, so the forms of the first law are really not that different than for the closed system. But it is a different equation, right? I derived it for you. It's a different equation. It's just slightly different. But you still have to use it, right? You still have to use enthalpy. The only time we use enthalpies for closed systems is when we combine the internal energy and the boundary work for a constant pressure process, right? That's the only time we ever use enthalpy for closed systems. For open systems, um, you always use enthalpy. You do not use internal energy. There is no internal energy term here, right? Just enthalpy. So let's look now at the types of devices that one would utilize this material for, and then I'll start going through example problems. So first of all, any questions, problems? Yes. Um, earlier when you said 
all the transfer and work curves will remain constant over time. Right. The, you mean the heat transfer rate? Right, rate? right. Q dot will not change during the problem. W dot will not change during the problem. The state within the control volume does not change during the course of the problem. The state of what's coming in never changes. The state that goes out never changes. So that's the nature of these many different problems. And um, again, that's the nature of real equipment. I mean, real equipment will eventually uh, come to some sort of equilibrium with its surroundings. Um, and, you know, you'll turn something on, it'll take a little while to warm up, but eventually it'll come to, to steady flow conditions and everything's going to remain constant. So, what are the devices that are going to be utilized here? And these are the same devices that are described in your book. So, um, first of all, there's a whole lot of signal stream steady flow devices that we're going to look at. Um, first will be nozzles and diffusers. Um, I would note that a nozzle <coughs> is everything is a diffuser that's operating in reverse. If you have a nozzle, um, you're going to decrease the flow area and whatever comes in at state point one in all likelihood is going to accelerate and come out at a higher velocity at state point two. I mean, that's the nature of nozzles, right? You're, you're using them so you can get a high velocity out of that system, just like on the end of a hose, right? You squirt something off the end of an open hose and it just kind of dribbles out. You put your thumb over it, kind of creating a flow restriction and a nozzle, or you just screw the nozzle on and, and you get high velocity. So that's a nozzle. The diffuser does the same thing, but in reverse. You're gonna enter the pipe and allow it to increase its area, causing it to slow down. So sometimes you'll have a fluid moving through some system where um, the velocity is too high, and you want to drop the speed before you utilize it, so you run it through the diffuser. Now, the thing about nozzles and diffusers is that typically, well, not typically, always, they're passive devices, right? They, they sit there. There's no moving parts. There's no work associated with this, right? There's no um, change in volume for sure, so there's no boundary work. Um, well, except for the boundary work that we already considered associated with the flow coming in and the flow going out. Um, there, there's no mixing devices, there's no um, shaft work. I mean, they're passive, right? They, they just sit there. So for these kind of problems, the work term is always going to equal zero. I mean, if you want to, you can use lower case letter W's, but um, I'll just note that the work term is always going to be zero. Also, there's never going to be a significant height change so the potential energy, uh, the change in potential <coughs> energy is also going to be zero. Okay, now even if you have this nozzle kind of pointing upwards, so there is a height change, um, something I mentioned in the past, um, maybe we didn't mention it in the past. Um, well, if I didn't mention it in the past, I'll mention it now. I guess it wasn't this class I mentioned it, but um, unless, uh, yeah, I did mention it. I talk too much sometimes. Um, Unless there's a very significant height change, the potential energy change is going to be negligible. Usually you need to have several meters, you know, maybe three or four meters before you have any real measurable potential energy change. So it makes sense to just assume the potential energy change is zero anyway. So when you go back to your basic form of the first law, um, the first law is going to be greatly simplified, right? Then you'll just end up with the heat transfer is going to equal the mass flow rate, and then times the entropy change plus the kinetic energy change. And again, to be consistent with the book, I've replaced my I's with ones and my E's with twos uh, just for consistency. So this is going to be the first law. This is going to be the first law. Um, I will note that sometimes the nozzle will be well insulated or the diffusion will be well insulated. Like if this is part of a piping system, it's probably going to be well insulated, in which case you may also have no heat transfer. Um, but certainly there's going to be a velocity change, and certainly there's going to be a change in the state between the inlet and the exit. So there will be different values of H1 and H2. Um, there will be a certain mass flow rate. Uh, but this would be a somewhat simpler version of the first law uh, associated with nozzles and diffusers. Uh, another type of process, or I should say equipment, is the pump compressor and turbine. Now, 
A pump and a compressor are the same thing. We just use the word pump to deal with liquids. We use the word compressor when we're dealing with vapors or two fixed mixtures. But they're the same basic device. Um, most of them that are out there are centrifugal devices. Um, they're going to have some sort of rotating blades on the inside. And those rotating blades are going to be hooked up to some source of work or power. An electric motor would be most common, right? So you hook an electric motor up, there's definitely going to be some shaft work coming in. Um, yes. um, but nonetheless, a pump and a compressor are the same thing. Uh, a turbine is really just a pump or a compressor that, that essentially works in reverse. Um, whereas a pump, you're going to have a fluid coming in and work is going to be done to that fluid in order to pressurize it and allow it to move out of the pump. A turbine is really the opposite. In a turbine, you're going to have some sort of a, presumably a high pressure, high temperature fluid coming in, and it's going to cause those blades to rotate like on a pinwheel. And work is going to go out. Um, you're going to be generating power, and presumably that power that's being generated is going to be used somewhere. You're going to use it maybe to run an electric generator uh, to create electricity. In fact, that's how turbines work at power plants. Um, but nonetheless, work is being done by the system as we move in and out. So they're still the same kind of device though, right? Um, they're still rotational devices with a work input or output based on the shaft work. And they're going to have inlets, they're going to have outlets. Um, there's probably going to be a velocity change associated with them. Um, the only term we really want to neglect here is again going to be potential energy change. So our first law then is going to be heat transfer, and this time we, we cannot neglect the work. So it's heat transfer minus work, and then that's going to equal the mass flow rate. And we have our entropy change and kinetic energy change. Again, no potential energy change. So this will be associated with pumps, turbines, and compressors. Now, um, I probably don't have to say this, but remember these are velocities. This is kinetic energy, not specific volume, so don't mess that up. Um, also, let's note that the minus sign within the equation is not to be confused with the sign of the work term itself. The minus sign will always be there. Um, if work is being done to the system, then that's negative work. And if work is being done by the system, then it's positive work, right? In other words, if it's a pump, you've got to do work to the system to spin the blades on that pump. So you'll have the negative of a negative term. Um, a turbine is a work output device, right? Work is going out. Um, as such, it's positive. So you would have the negative of a positive term. That might seem a little counterintuitive, but that's the nature of these problems, right? So don't confuse the sign of an individual term with signs that exist within the equation. The equation is very specific. You never want to mess with that. So this is what you have. I might also note that for a pump, compressor, or turbine, Often those are also well insulated devices. Um, you don't want to be losing energy into the surroundings. You want to keep the energy within your device. So if it's well insulated, then you may have zero heat transfer. But you know, read the problems carefully um, so you know whether you want to include that or not. Um, the next category of devices that we're going to look at are well, actually not the next category, the next type of single stream steady flow process we look at is called the throttle. Um, now, most people don't know much about throttles, even though one exists in every single air conditioner and refrigerator and freezer on the planet. Well, maybe since everyone, there's types of refrigeration cycles that don't use throttles, but most do. They just call it an expansion valve, but, it, but it's still a throttle. Um, basically, a throttle is a smooth, constriction followed by expansion. Um, and throttles are always well insulated. Um, the reason you'd have a throttle is to reduce the pressure. Um, that's what these devices are used for. So I don't know, maybe we're talking about a power plant where the water moving through the power plant is at a whopping 2,000 pounds per square inch, but you know you have to clean up that water stream. Do um, you really want to filter water at 2,000 pounds per square inch? I mean, think of how thick the walls of that filter vessel are going to have to be so they don't burst under those massive pressures. Well, so you don't. You, you connect the main pipes up to a throttle, 
you drop the pressure down to atmospheric pressure, then you can build a thin wall filter vessel that you're not going to worry about exploding under the high pressure of that water. You filter the water, and then you just pump it back up to the high pressure, and you put it back into your system. So I mean, that might be an example of why one might use a throttle. Um, but what's unique about throttles is that because they're well insulated, um, there's no heat transfer. Um, because they're completely passive devices, there's no work or power associated with them. Um, because there's no significant elevation change, there's no great or really no measurable potential energy change. And because um, the velocity doesn't change much, I mean, consider that the area in and out are more or less going to be the same. Um, the velocity typically is not going to change very much. Um, we would therefore note that the kinetic energy can also be assumed to be approximately zero. So what does that give you for the first law? Like nothing. All that's left are your enthalpy change terms. Um, so you end up with the enthalpy in is going to equal the enthalpy out. So that's what's left of the first law for a throttle. Uh, there's one throttle problem that I assigned in your homework, and some of you are going to look at that and think that it's got to be a lot more complicated than it really is. But it isn't. H1 equals H2. That's how throttles work. Okay, and then we have other devices. The other category, the next category, is going to be steady flow devices but not single stream steady flow devices, just steady flow. And here we have our heat exchangers as one type of device. So, you know, with a heat exchanger, um, we know that we have two fluids. Um, let's just say this is my heat exchanger. Uh, we've got one fluid that passes through one side of the heat exchanger. Um, we have another fluid that passes through the other side of the heat exchanger. Um, th there's no actual mixing between the two, but there certainly is heat transfer uh, between the two streams. But with heat exchangers, we can also neglect a lot of terms. Um, first of all, heat exchangers are also going to be w very well insulated. So, I mean, again, you don't want to lose heat to the surroundings, so heat transfer is equal to zero. Um, these are, again, passive devices, right? They're just pipes that sit there and just exchange heat all day long, so there's no work. There's also no potential energy change because they don't change the height at all. Um, most heat exchangers are run in the horizontal axis. And there's also no kinetic energy change. I might note that in a typical mechanical device, you need to keep the speeds down. Um, if the speed goes over maybe 10 feet per second, kind of a rule of thumb, then you begin to erode the inside of your tubes, your, your heat exchanger surfaces. And erosion, um, well, means you're losing metal. You know, you're losing material. Eventually, you can erode <coughs> all the way down to a hole in your piping. And then your fluids are starting to mix, and it's not much of a heat exchanger anymore. So you're going to specifically attempt to keep the velocities low and unchanging if you can. So there's no kinetic energy change. So again, what's left of the first law is not much except for the enthalpy terms. Although, because we do have multiple inlets and exits, we would still have the summation. So the summation overall inlets, m dot i h i, would equal the summation overall exits of m dot e h e. But everything else goes away. And then the last type of device that we would be interested in is what we call a mixing chamber. So with a mixing chamber, we basically have two streams that are going to mix together, and one stream is going to come out. Um, this is not uncommon. I mean, you will often have multiple streams that you're going to have to mix together for one reason or another in some sort of an industrial application. But again, very much like the heat exchanger above, uh, these are typically going to be well insulated. Um, they're passive devices, so there's no mixing. I mean, they're called mixing chamber, but that's because the two fluids mix together. But there's no work device that's assisting in that mixing process. So there's no work. Um, there's also no significant height change. And again, because of erosion issues, um, you're definitely going to keep the kinetic energy low and unchanging. So that basically gives you a form of the first law that's not a whole lot different than we had for the heat exchanger. Although, 
there's only one exit path, so we don't need a summation on the exit side. So we sum over the two inlet streams, m dot i h i, and then this simply equals m dot e h e. So that's the first law that we would utilize. Um, now I suppose that for any of these, one could break the general rules. You know, maybe for any of these, you could have a heat transfer term that you'd have to consider. And maybe for any of these, you might have some work device you would have to consider. But in general, these equations that I've written will be the appropriate equations. Still, read the problems carefully. Uh, make sure you understand what's being asked of you. Um, and use all the appropriate terms as you can. Um, by the way, just one other comment regarding the heat exchanger. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are thinking, well, wait a minute, it's a heat exchanger, so clearly there's heat transfer. How can we assume that there's no heat transfer when it's a heat exchanger and there's heat transfer? But there isn't heat transfer across the boundary, right? Both of these fluid paths are within the boundary of the system. Um, whatever heat is lost by one stream is exactly equal to that gain by the other stream. So there is no net heat transfer, and if it's well insulated, it's only that heat transfer that's included within the first law anyway, right? It's heat transfer across the boundary. So yes, there's heat exchange internal to the device, but there's no heat lost in the surroundings because of the insulated nature of this device. Uh, so that's why we say that there's no heat transfer in a heat exchange. Uh, so anyway. Um, no, no, because there's only a single exit. There's multiple inlets, but there's only one exit for the same chamber, so that's why I dropped the summations. Yeah. Um, when you say uh, there can be multiple uh, inlets and exits for the heat exchanger, mm -hmm. what would that look like? Like, would it be like two things going one way, two things going like that? Like yeah, I mean, I, I've shown this with the two flow paths in opposite directions, we call it a counterflow heat exchanger. And the reason you do that is because you can maximize the temperature difference on each side of the heat exchanger. And what you'll learn in your 415 class is that the rates of heat transfer is a function of the temperature difference. If you have the both fluids coming in on the same side, then you have a nice big temperature difference on the side that they're both entering. But as heat is exchanged, then the two temperatures become really close to each other and you would end up with a very small temperature difference on one end of the heat exchanger. So it turns out you're, you're much better off having the flows counter to each other to keep the temperature difference significant so your heat transfer rates are more significant. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, they're just selling tube devices. Um, I mean, if we can go up into the ceiling and open up the system that's up there, You basically just have a, a big, uh, really it's a big piece of ductwork. And then coming in the side of that duct is going to be a tube filled with water, filled with water. So, you know, we have airflow and then airflow coming out. We have water coming in and then water going out. Um, if it's air conditioning season, then you'll have cold water that comes in from the Cal Poly Central Chiller Plant, which is a big giant tank that's up on top of the hill behind the health center. And if it's heating season, then you'll have high temperature water that comes in from the round building that's right next to the library, you know, kind of down below there, below engineering in the library. There's that big round building that has like six boilers in it. Provides hot water for the whole campus. But there's just heat exchangers, so yeah. And there's all sorts of different types. I mean, you could have a single tube, single cell heat exchanger. In other words, just take a small diameter tube and put it inside a large diameter tube. You have a hot fluid moving over the outside of the little tube, inside the big tube. You have a cold fluid moving inside the little tube. One heats up, the other cools down. I mean, those are heat exchangers, and there's all sorts of types, plate heat exchangers, shell and tube heat exchangers. Uh, I mean, there's so many, so many. So these are the kind of devices we're going to have to look at. And the next thing to do then would be to simply start going through a variety of example problems. And I think um, the first one I want to do in two minutes. Well, I'm not going to exactly finish it. Um, Uh-oh. So the first one I want to do, and maybe all we're going to have the time to do right now is just read it to you. Um, but this is going to be problem 5-30 from the current version of your textbook.
So, um, again, I can't exactly finish this problem today, but at least this is representative of a pretty typical heat exchanger problem. So five, I'm oh, sorry, not heat exchanger, a pretty typical uh, single stream steady flow problem. This is 530. So well, let me just make sure you, you read the problem. You know, maybe you want to put it into your notes or uh, just remember most of the aspects of it for next time. Um, but clearly this is a nozzle. Um, you're told that it uses steam and it enters at a particular temperature and pressure, 400 Celsius, 800 kilopascal, with a certain speed of 10 meters per second. And it gives you the temperature and pressure at the exit. Um, it tells you 300 Celsius and 200 kilopascals are the exit conditions. And it does tell you that you're losing heat to the surroundings at a particular rate of 25 kilowatts, although personally I would have rather used the phrase kilojoules per second. You know, heat transfer rates are heat per unit time, kilojoules per second. It turns out that's a kilowatt. Uh, power terms would be given in kilowatts, heat transfer rates in kilojoules per second, but it's the same units. But nonetheless, 25 kilojoules per second is the rate that we're losing heat. It gives me the inlet area of 800 square centimeters, and we want to find the velocity and the volumetric flow rate at the exit from the nozzle. So, as is consistent with most of these types of problems, we have to simultaneously um, solve the continuity equation, a mass flow rate equation, if you will, along with, <coughs> along with the first law equation. Note that we're looking for a rate, right? Um, we're looking for a volumetric flow rate, which means we really need to find the exit velocity in order to find the volumetric flow rate. And that exit velocity is going to come from the first law of thermodynamics. Um, but we also are going to need the mass flow rate in our first law of thermodynamics equation. And the only way you find the mass flow rate is through the continuity equation, which tells us that the velocity times the area of the specific volume equals mass flow rate. So we're definitely going to have to use both the continuity and the first law equations to solve this particular problem. Um, nonetheless, it's a very straightforward problem, but I've run out of time. So, um, we'll start this and finish this next time. Um, I've also got a turbine problem that I'm going to go through. I've got a heat exchanger problem that I'm going to go through, and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of those. Um, yeah, we probably won't finish all of them next time. I think I'll kind of carry over into Monday and finish all this off. But, but there's a lot of stuff you're going to have to know how to do here. So that's all for today. Please don't forget to pick up, I'm sorry, to drop off your homework. Um, also, if anybody didn't pick up their exams, I've got some of those up here at the front.